everybody, and welcome to CCA's episode 63 of our Medical Minute podcast, sponsored by Kroger Health. We're very pleased today to have Dr. Ann Partridge from Dana Farmer Institute in Boston. Uh, Dr. Partridge is a nationally renowned medical oncologist uh, with multiple degrees, and uh, as a friend of mine used to say, more letters behind her name than the Cambodian <laughs> a- alphabet. Uh, so uh, anyway, welcome, Dr. Partridge. Hi, thanks for having me. Yeah, no problem. We're happy to do it. Um, one thing, just on a personal note, is it true that you drive 60 miles each way to work? Uh, it is true that I live 60 miles from where I work. That is that is correct. And um, it is, uh, the commute doesn't get any shorter, unfortunately. <laughs> and the traffic uh, has gotten worse uh, over the years. And we had a little pandemic retrieve, reprieve, reprieve. Yeah. Uh, and now it's as bad as ever. So yes, this is All true. Right. And I think we should mention uh, she's in the Boston region. Yeah, Boston. Right. That's right. That's right. Well, she and she lives in New Bedford, if I'm allowed to say that. But uh, anyway, uh, at least we didn't make you drive here today. We're, we're on <laughs> Zoom. Thank so. that. that would have yeah, been yeah. I would, maybe it would have given me some perspective. But <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, so Dr. Partridge, we were fortunate enough to have you at our second uh, annual um, ASCO Direct uh, Best of Oncology Conference here in Cincinnati this past October. Uh, where you spoke on survivorship. But what we want to talk to you about today um, is a much talked about um, s- uh, clinical st- trial that you've recently been involved in. Uh, in fact, I saw it on the Today Show and I told Sherry right away, mm-hmm. I'm like, we've got to get Dr. Partridge. Um, but it's on, um, if I understand it correctly, uh, I think it was called the positive study. And um, it's on, uh, really deals with being able to, to delay pregnancy for um, childbearing age females, obviously. Um, but I'm, Sherry's got a couple questions and I'll turn it over to her because it seems kind of weird for a guy to be asking <laughs> these questions, but, uh, Not at all. if you could just kind of tell us a little bit about, um, it, you know, well, first and foremost, as I understand, I think your practice is primarily focused on, uh, younger women. Is that unusual? I mean, to, in an oncology practice to focus really kind of on an age group. Um, so it is unusual for a person to particularly practice in a focused young women's uh, area of expertise. I'm in a big cancer center, so I I can do that and I do research. But I think the more important thing is that increasingly our cancer community is recognizing that our adolescent and young adult patients, those AYA patients are more likely to suffer than older patients and even younger patients in in many ways. They deal with the usual slings and arrows of a cancer diagnosis, but then they have these other issues that are either unique to being young or accentuated by being young. And one of the best examples is fertility and threat to fertility, because these are folks that haven't necessarily completed their families or even started them yet. And so, Dr. Uh, Partridge, this is Sherry Hughes now. With it being that you have a particular focus on fertility preservation, um, was that kind of like the catalyst for the, 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 the focus of the positive clinical trial? The positive trial was actually designed to address a clinical dilemma that young women with breast cancer face in particular. So most young women, when they're diagnosed with breast cancer, are diagnosed with something called hormone receptor positive breast cancer. That means that they have hormone receptors expressed on their tumors and that we are going to typically use anti-hormone therapy or endocrine therapy to treat them, to reduce their chances of hearing from breast cancer again once they've had their surgery and any other you know, chemo if they need it and other treatments. And so those women may not have completed their families may be interested in future fertility, right? We've done surveys of this and at least 50% of women say at diagnosis, when they're diagnosed under the age of 40, that they're interested in future fertility. And then those women are told, oh, you have to take this endocrine therapy to treat your breast cancer. And by the way, it's a five to 10 year course. Oh, wow. Yeah, and so you're pretty much summing up what the breast cancer study is all about. So you mentioned though, endocrine uh, therapy and for some people that aren't in the world of cancer, um, they're wondering, they would wonder, well, what exactly is that? What, what does it mean and how will it impact these uh, women that are diagnosed? And, and how is it different than chemo, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, so that's a great question. So. Endocrine therapy and chemotherapy are both used to treat breast cancer. And we typically give 
treatment for breast cancer based on both the how much breast cancer women have or men have because they can get breast cancer, as well as what the tumor looks like under the microscope and with special tests. We call that kind of the personality or the phenotype of a breast cancer. And the most common breast cancer that is diagnosed is hormone receptor positive breast cancer, which means that it expresses estrogen or progesterone receptors on its surface, and that it may be driven or fed by hormones like estrogen. And therefore, we've learned over many, many years that a mainstay of reducing risk of hearing from those breast cancers again is taking medications, often it's a pill a day, to block that estrogen receptor and or lower the estrogen in the body. And that can cut risk of breast cancer recurrence in half. Wow. Yeah. So g- take us back into, let's dive back into the study itself. Exactly how many participants were there in the study? And, um, you know, when did you first start to see signals that uh, this is turning more to the positive side? Well, we named it positive for a reason. <laughs> you know, that was our good acronym and we decided it had to be positive, uh, but we weren't sure. And we, we did it as a research study because we, you know, there have been historical concerns that a pregnancy and all the hormones of a pregnancy might increase the risk of a woman hearing from her breast cancer again, especially if that breast cancer was hormone sensitive. And part of the mainstay, as I just said, is reducing risk uh, and, and blocking estrogens. And so we said, let's test that. And we enrolled 518 women over a four year period, pretty much around the world. Mm, And we couldn't do a randomized trial here because you can't randomize women to you get a baby and you don't. Right. Right. Typically that just wouldn't fly. No woman would go on that. In China, they do that. Uh Yeah, exactly. They would reject (laughs) that. And so bottom line is that women went on in a registry fashion, but we had a really kind of protocolized way for them to be cared for. And what they were dealing with was the fact that they'd been prescribed hormonal therapy for five to 10 years. And we said, okay, take at least 18 months of that hormonal therapy, then come off, get the hormones out of your system. And then you can try to get pregnant, carry the child if you're lucky enough to get pregnant, and then get back on the hormonal therapy after you've delivered and potentially breastfed, if that's something you've chosen to do. And then we watched them over time to see what their recurrence rates were. And we compared them not only to a safety threshold we had set of how many recurrences is too many to call this safe. And we also compared them to a historical control group that we had used. And we did this very kind of uh, very detailed analysis to create this control analysis from a group of women who hadn't uh, stopped their endocrine therapy. Dr. Partridge, now that uh, this study is out, has been revealed, and as you said, it's global, um, what's next for the women that find themselves in this position? How can they start immediately taking advantage of the findings from the study? Well, I think that right now the data showed us, the positive trial showed us that the women in the study did not appear to have an increased risk of hearing from their breast cancer again if they interrupted endocrine therapy to have a pregnancy. And the majority of women had a pregnancy and had a live birth, which is great. And the majority of women got back on that endocrine therapy. That's the critical piece. Mm -hmm. It's not stopping your endocrine therapy. It's interrupting for pregnancy. They got back on and they were going to complete a five to 10 year course, depending on their doctor's recommendation and their preference and tolerance. And so we know from the positive initial findings that things look pretty good and they didn't look to do any worse or any better, but we need to follow them more long-term because breast cancer that's hormone sensitive doesn't just come back, unfortunately, in the first three to five years, it can come back a decade or more later. So the most important thing for these women is we're going to continue to follow them over time. And for anybody who's making decisions about having a baby in the throes of kind of dealing with the hormonal therapy, I think these data are very reassuring that women can do this and discuss with their doctors, depending on their level of risk of recurrence, right? So very low risk women, yeah, we're not so worried. Very high risk women, as I said, it didn't make things worse, but some women are very high risk Mm -hmm. from hearing their breast cancer again. And it certainly can happen that you can have your breast cancer come back during a pregnancy 
or early on in a, a child's life. Gotcha. Um, so Dr. Partridge, one question, I'm just curious because I was wondering as well what, what it meant, uh, endo endocrine therapy. Um, I'm a prostate cancer survivor. Is that kind of synonymous, like with, I think about ADT, like androgen deprivation therapy, is it kind of synonymous with that? It sounded similar. It is very, very similar, very okay. similar kind of uh, paradigm in terms of kind of choking off the supply line yeah. mm -hmm. yep. that might be feeding this hormone responsive tumor. Yep. Gotcha. Gotcha. All right, Sherry. Well, I think we have to let uh, Dr. Partridge get yeah, back to work. But so, thank you so much. It's yeah. just uh, so encouraging to hear that this study has yielded positive and that really it will help so many women um, be able to continue on with their family planning. Yeah. Yeah. Really great. So we'll, we'll, uh, we'll keep an eye on that and uh, hopefully we'll see you back at our oncology seminar again. That would be nice. I love that. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Just don't drive it. <laughs> Thanks again. Thank you, Dr. Partridge. Thank you. All right. Okay. Well, that was uh, Dr. Ann Partridge um, from Dana-Farber uh, Institute, of course, one of the most renowned uh, cancer institutes in the country, if not the world. So, uh, and we really we'll mentioned that she's also a professor in Harvard. That's not too yeah, shabby. That's not too, not too shabby, shabby at all. <laughs> all right. Well, sounds good. Well, everybody join us uh, next time and uh, we'll figure out what the topic is sometime between now and then. So uh, it'll be something good though. Take care, everybody. <laughs>